Welcome back to Uncharted X. This is Ben, and today, this video is something that I'd hoped to make for quite some time. A detailed, defined, and professional analysis of the precision manufacturing that was used to create a truly ancient artifact. Our subject here is a stone vase from ancient Egypt, carved from a single block of igneous granite, dated to pre-dynastic Mesolithic times. That is to say, it's at least 5,200 years old and potentially much older than that. The details and analysis of this vase that you'll see in this video will demonstrate the irremediable truth of work involved in its manufacturing, the cold, hard facts of the geometric precision achieved in its creation. The implications of this truth on the debate around the existence of ancient high technology are utterly profound and entirely devastating to the orthodox claims that simple, primitive hand tools can explain everything that we see from this era in history. This is why this kind of work is just so important. It's an indication of significantly advanced technology, deployed and utilised in distant periods of our past. Periods today only associated with the very beginnings of human civilization. At the very least, evidence like this should force a rethink of what we think we know about the people and civilizations who lived in those times. But much more likely, I think it's a clue to a far longer timeline of our species, one that involves lost, ancient and advanced civilizations that existed before the world-changing cataclysm of the Younger Dryas, or the periods that preceded it. Strong claims, you might say, but I think they're warranted here. So sit back, take this journey with me, look at the data yourself, and listen to the real expert metrologists who did the work, and as always, make up your own mind. If you're viewing this as a result of my recent appearance on the Joe Rogan Experience, in which I briefly introduced the analysis of this vase, then welcome. Thanks for watching. Let's get into the details, and I hope you enjoy the rest of my channel. Before we get started, I wanted to quickly mention that I'll be speaking on the topic of ancient engineering at the upcoming Cosmic Summit 2023 conference, held June 17 and 18 at the Crown Plaza Resort in Asheville, North Carolina. I'll be joined by several friends and colleagues, Graham Hancock, Randall Carlson, Jimmy Cassetti, and Snake Bro Russ, amongst others. And we also have great representation from the scientific field, with the likes of Dr. Alan West, the director of the Cosmic Research Group, Dr. Andrew Moore, a past president of the Archaeological Institute of America, and Dr. Stephen Collins, the dig director of the fascinating Tel al Hammam site in Jordan. It promises to be an epic event, a deliberate mix of speculators and authors with published and credentialed scientists. The conference is fast approaching sellout for in-person tickets, but it will also be live streamed and available for online replay. So if you're interested in the conference and would like to support my work, the live stream ticket is a great way to do just that. You can find all the details at howtube.com slash unchartedx, and it's also linked below in the description. Also, quick mention, I'll be joining Hugh Newman, JJ Ainsworth, and my good friend Yusuf Awen for a tour of megalithic England this July, which will be my first chance to check all of that out. We just put this trip together, the details are all up on my website. Along the same lines, there's literally a couple of spaces left on my upcoming tour of ancient sites in Turkey, which happens this April. So if you're interested in either of those, all of the details are up on unchartedx.com. In many of my previous videos, probably most of them, I've called for exactly the type of work that is the subject of this video, applying our modern high-tech metrology and measurement tools to accurately define and analyze ancient artifacts, in particular those that display obvious signs of precision. I'm very happy to say that this is exactly what's happened here. I was contacted by Alex Dunn, Chris Dunn's youngest son, and his colleague Nick Sierra, who were both professional metrologists working in the aerospace industry. All right, Nick Sierra, Alex Dunn, thanks so much for taking a bit of time to chat with me about this stuff. Yeah, no problem. Our pleasure. Yeah, it's good to talk. I know we've been, we've been chatting about this a little bit in the past, and and it was a topic. I it was it was a the timing on it was amazing. I, I think you guys said the same thing. The fact that it, it this came up what a, a few weeks, a month or two before I had the chance to go on Rogan's show and uh, and get into it, and it was for me it was like this number the number one thing I really wanted to communicate because looking at and the work you guys are doing with these the vases and defining this precision is exactly the type of stuff i think we need in this field so thank you for uh, for reaching out to, to start with 
yeah absolutely well thank you for uh thank you for the shout out that was very cool yeah yeah it was fun that whole experience was was wild but um <laughs> where are we where we want to start or at least for me is uh first of all just like introduce yourselves so i'd love to learn a little bit a little bit more about what you guys do professionally why you're qualified to talk about this stuff and how you have access to kind of the the machinery and structured light scanners uh that you've used on this vase sure excellent um i'll start off so I'm probably most recognizable as uh, you announced on Joe Rogan's show. I am uh, Christopher Dunn's youngest son, Alex. I have been in the metrology field for about 10 years now, and uh, I've used pretty much every style of instrument that is available to a metrologist from CMMs to structured light scanners and laser scanners, all professionally in the aerospace field. The vase that was scanned is um, the property of a friend of ours, and he had it scanned through a company out in Connecticut named Capture 3D, and they used a GOM ATOS structured light scanner to produce the STL file, which Nick and I then did a full inspection in a sof software called Polyworks. Yeah, and uh, that's kind of where I came into this uh madness if you will um alex uh showed me this uh the scan and he explained what he saw to me and uh i have a, a degree in aeronautical engineering technology from purdue and uh, i'm also a licensed aircraft mechanic um, fun fact um so uh i enjoy hands-on stuff i enjoy you know theoretical stuff and um, I've done CNC programming um, and, and machining, and then I'm also done programming for uh, measurement equipment, and everything. And so, as as you know, my mind sees this, and I was just like, "There's no way that this was done by hand." I mean, uh, there I've seen things cut in the CNC machine that are worse than this and they're not even granite. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, I, I dove right in um, and started applying that uh, analytical side. And uh, again, like Alex said, we used Polyworks to take and extract all these features uh, from this scanned mesh. And the, the results that we saw were just, uh, I mean, you, you can't explain it except with a, a machine center or, or something of that nature that could have done this. Um, and I will talk about that in depth a little yep. later. Yep. While in Egypt a few years back with his father, Alex met Adam Young, who happened to have a couple of ancient pieces in his possession, including this vase. Artifacts like this do come up for sale or auction from time to time, usually from estate sales or from private collections. And we're also joined by Adam Young. Uh, Adam, thank you so much for, for the time today. And just, uh, yeah, I'd love to understand how you got involved in all of this uh, this topic, how you um, how you met these guys and, and how they got their hands uh, on the vase and, and kind of led us to what we're talking about today. Yeah, sure. Uh, pleasure to be here. Thank you, Ben. Um, Alex and I have known each other for a few years. We met through his father, of course, Chris. Uh, I've been to Egypt with Chris as well as as Robert Schock and some others, and um, had the pleasure of first going there a little over 10 years ago and saw in the Egyptian Museum and the Cairo M Museum, as well as at the sites, saw some of the precision in, I think, some of the largest structures and some of the smallest ones. Mm -hmm. And uh, ever since then had had kind of an eye for, you know, recognizing it. And I think when you see these sorts of, of of artifacts, like call it the vessels or the round ones, your eye can can recognize kind of a perfect circle from a, from a distance away. Um, but once you get up close, the, you know the precision in comparison to to maybe pottery or other types of vessels is really very clear. Um, of course, what we we're seeking to do is to to measure it at a more finite level and on a much more you know accurate scale. But in a museum, behind plexiglass, even online in photographs. You can really recognize, uh, you know, the the extensive precision of work that must have went into yeah. to, to creating these. And so, you know, for the past, I'd say seven, eight, nine years, uh, my wife and I have been kind of looking for anytime we see artifacts through through dealers or um, or private collectors that are for sale, we take a look. And if it looks like it might be pre dynastic or impressive in some way, um, you know, we we have been accumulating some of these things. So yeah, awesome. we probably have. We probably have 40 or 50. Um, they're not all as precise as 
the red or the rose granite vase that we that that Alex and um, his colleagues took a look at a few years back. Uh, but there are there are a number of them. Um, you know, and just in in Saqqara alone, there was I think forty or fifty thousand yeah. found in numerous occasions. Yep. Um, so it's you know these things. Um, to me, when anybody asks, I say that you know they were kind of stacked up like Tupperware and forgotten. So that tells you that you know it probably was easy for someone to make at some point. Yeah, indeed. Well, and. First of all, I mean, a massive thank you for letting them get their hands on it as well and actually scan it because this is, you know, exactly the kind of work that is needed. And, and in general, certainly I've found, you know, museum curators and the, 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 the mainstream uh, museums really don't have a lot of interest in exploring the, I guess, the engineering aspects of some of these artifacts because, you know, you can just look at them behind the glass cases. And, yeah, I, I have the same observations as a, 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 like a dozens of, of examples that I can name from the Cairo Museum alone, having been there a bunch of times that you know should be subject to these types of scans and i think as we're finding out when you find the ones that do you know that are in the right shape that seem to display those elements of precision symmetry all those types of things it's it's astonishing the results that that start to come out of it so you know i'm hopeful that the work you guys are doing and and the results from this might trigger some more people that you know potentially have some of these artifacts and maybe even museum curators that that might be willing to to have some of these artifacts scanned because at the end of the day it's you know it's, it's harmless it's not going to hurt them at all and it's we might actually end up learning something some of them yeah we i mean we've seen reluctance from from most academics as you can imagine like they already know the answers so why i keep looking but <laughs> i think it, it can vary you know country to country location by location some people are open-minded yep. and recognize that you know some of these may not have been done by hand even if they think it's a pottery wheel or something rudimentary they may still be open to it so i wouldn't you know give up hope altogether okay the vase in question is considered pre-dynastic. In other words, it was found in a tomb or burial dated to before Menes, the first pharaoh of the first dynasty, which began around 3150 BC, more than 5,000 years ago. Pre-dynastic burials in Egypt go way back from that date, as far back as even 15,000 years ago, and artifacts like this vase or other igneous stone objects carved with what seem to be high degrees of precision have been found many times in those sites, and there are plenty of pre-dynastic examples on display in places like the Cairo Museum. I'd imagine that an easy criticism of this work might be around the provenance of the vase we're looking at. In other words, how do we know if it is really pre-dynastic? I'm personally confident that it is. It certainly matches the form and style of other pre-dynastic vases on display in museums, and it's made from the same rose granite as is the box in the king's chamber of the Great Pyramid. When we get into the scan results and the analysis of the precision that's evident in its construction, however, I think the question of provenance becomes moot as it's so far beyond even the relatively primitive capabilities of the dynastic Egyptians, at least as we know them. It is worth understanding a bit more about how these types of artifacts get into circulation. You have to go back a couple hundred years to the times when Americans and Europeans like the French, Germans and English were deeply involved in both governing and excavating Egypt. Many artifacts were given as gifts to officials, and others were undoubtedly just taken from excavations and put into private collections, some of which filtered down to auctions or estate sales and the like in today's time. Some might even suspect that this practice has continued down to modern times, but uh, who really knows? Could they have no shop? Ultimately, it doesn't matter to me if this vase is considered pre-dynastic or if it's from the Old Kingdom. These types of precision-made hardstone artifacts disappear from the timeline after the 3rd and 4th dynasty, and even if they are found in burials dated to that time, many of them are admittedly inherited heirlooms that are far older. This isn't controversial, it's the official line, as explained in the museum at Saqqara when discussing the 40 to 50,000 of such artifacts that were discovered beneath the Steppe Pyramid of Djoser, a ruler of the 3rd dynasty of the Old Kingdom. These artifacts are generally dated by where they are found, or by whatever poorly scratched or chiselled name is found on them. It's a glaringly obvious technological mismatch between the hieroglyphs and the object itself that I've discussed many times. Before we get into the scan results, I do want to provide some context around these hardstone vases and their place in ancient Egyptian history. I've covered the vases in detail in a couple of previous videos, so do check those out if you haven't seen them, as we're going to speedrun it this time. Here we go. There exists a category of artifacts from the earliest times of ancient Egypt. Hardstone vases, vessels, dishes and more, ranging in size from large to very small. 
made from a wide range of igneous stone like granite, diorite, porphyry, slate, schist, cyanite, rock crystal, or even corundum, all incredibly hard materials, harder than steel, ranging from 6 to 9 on the most scale of hardness. They display truly remarkable characteristics of precision manufacturing, perfect symmetry and balance, immaculate polished and smooth surfaces, machining and turning tool marks on the interiors, and some with an astonishing thinness of material, translucent stone, down to even 1 40th of an inch thick. Truly challenging, as these types of hard stones become brittle when thin, and carving them is no simple task. The stone matrix goes from softer materials like mica or hornblende, to very hard materials like the obvious large quartz crystal inclusions seen on many examples. Found in great numbers in burials from as far back as Mesolithic times, they're often displayed next to bones, beads and primitive pottery vases, clearly imitations of the hard stone vessels, some even painted to mimic granite. The bulk of these were recovered from beneath the Third Dynasty Steppe Pyramid of Joseph at Saqqara, 40 to 50,000 of them, and fragments of vases and dishes can still be seen and handled down there today. Many of these are, as I mentioned earlier, inherited and collected from earlier times, even according to the official story. After the Third and Fourth Dynasty, these objects disappear from the Egyptian timeline, with a very few exceptions, and even then those are dated to the poorly inscribed glyphs that are found on them. After this period, ancient Egyptian vases were generally formed from alabaster, or white calcite, a far softer stone that is orders of magnitude easier to work, and which can be shaped with simple hand tools. These alabaster vases, while beautiful, do not display the same characteristics of precision that the older hard stone vases do. A scene on a wall found in Saqqara is used by Egyptologists to explain all of the vases, but rather I think it shows the manufacturing of alabaster vases alone, likely a process invented by the polymath Imhotep in order to imitate the amazing ancient stone vessels that they collected in vast numbers. Okay, now let's get into the details of the precision found on the granite vase. First, the process. A structured light scanner was used to create a model of the vase down to one thousandth of an inch in accuracy, or around 0 0.02 of a millimetre. I'll make both the imperial and the metric reports of this vase scan available on my website, but I'm going to stick with the imperial measurements in this video. For context, a sheet of printer paper is around 7.5 thousandths of an inch thick, and the width of a human hair is between 2 and 3 thousandths, so we're talking accuracy to the level of half the width of a human hair. Scanners like this are not an everyday tool. These devices are generally used for precision applications in the aerospace industry, and can run you upwards of a quarter million dollars. The vase itself is an ellipsoid, which isn't a measurable geometric shape, so different parts and surfaces of the vase were matched to geometric shapes – planes, cylinders, spheres, cones and the like – by extremely dense point clouds made up of many thousands of points, making them extremely accurate, and this vase was scanned to a level far beyond the typical application of such a tool. Once you have a geometric shape defined, you can perform geometry on it, calculate its precision, and most importantly, its relationship to the other surfaces, shapes and planes of the vase. This relationship between different areas of the vase is where the true precision and astounding nature of its manufacture really shows through. By defining some surfaces as control planes or the axes of the vase, think of an X or a Y axis, as well as a true center line, you can now not only calculate the precision of different parts of the vase, but their precision in relation to these axes and to the centerline, as Nick and Alex will explain. The uh, vase itself is comprised of, I think, about 200,000 points stitched into a mesh, um, which uh, can create what you see as the visual surface of the, of the outside of the vase. So... All of these are just a high, high density of points, which are then stitched together to give a solid CAD body. So Adam had the vase scanned and he sent me the STL in which Nick and I used Polyworks software to do the inspection. So Polyworks is one of the leading um, metrology softwares in manufacturing. It, it enables you to take um, point data it, whether it comes from um, a CMM, a single point CMM, or a, any kind of scanning technology like a structured light scanner, and produce a, um, a report that does analyze the geometry based on what I would consider typical CMM methods, planes, lines, and points, is what we try to reduce everything down to. 
um, in order to make the geometry communicate uh, able to communicate the geometry. Yep. So when we start with the very top of the vase, this is where we decided to build our geometric coordinate system. It was the kind of the obvious choice and it displayed the highest level of accuracy. So when you're building up what we consider a datum structure, you want your reference features is what they really become to be as accurate as possible. Mm -hmm. So our the top of the vase is flat within three thousandths of an inch, which Ben did address that this can be done by rubbing two stones together um three no one's yeah uh yeah so no one's that's that's okay that's anecdotal in my opinion um because the rest of the geometry does tell the story so this is what we consider our primary datum a uh, a planar surface that locks in three degrees of rotation in our coordinate system followed by the vase mouth which i'll let nick get into that one yeah so on the vase mouth what we were looking at really is you have your data may plane and we're referencing that plane to establish the perpendicularity of the cylinder of that vase mouth. Um, that cylinder used a little over 10,000 points to uh, construct that feature. And when we look at that, you get a, a thousandth of an inch deviation yeah. from perfect perpendicularity. Um, and I, I will say also the, the data with this, we didn't go out of our way to exclude a lot of uh, points. And, you know, this is a 5,000 year old base. There's some deviations in this. Um, so, yeah, it's a thousandth of an inch. Yeah. That's really incredible to see a perpendicularity that close. Yeah, and what you're saying, there's some, there was a, there's a bit of damage on the inside of the lip, and I know, and I'll mm -hmm. put in some of the footage from our first talk where you showed the actual model and showed some of the. There is a bit of damage, like you said, and it's a, it's an old va. It's like at least five thousand years old. Oh, there yeah. we are. Yeah, cool. Yes, yeah. Adam's, yeah. Adam's showing it. That's awesome. Yep. Look at that thing. Yeah. Wow. We are we are we are a bit spoiled by our our day to day lives where. Uh, that's cool. We'll see a deviation like thirteen thou and suddenly think, oh, oh, there's an issue there, but. In context, um, it's still absolutely remarkable for its age. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then again, that that shows in that uh, cylindricity measurement there how cylindrical that feature is, uh, thirteen thousandths of an inch. So you know these are deviations from what a perfect geometric feature would be. Yeah. And that is crazy. Yeah, it is. And I want to be clear so people understand what we're talking about. So the way this. What did you, you describe this as? It's oblate or it's a, it's oblong, like the the nature of the vase. You, it's not like a geometrically measurable shape on its own. And what right. you're doing when you scan it is you're mapping a a geometric shape that then you can perform geometry calculations on, uh, be it a you know a cylinder, a sphere, a cone, a flat plane. That's what yeah. that's that's how you determine the relative nature of different parts of the vase to each other, right? You're, you're mapping. Yeah geometric shapes to sections of the vase and then performing geometry on those right yeah. yeah and to be a little more specific just just to explain a little bit uh best fit is something that i think most people will understand the concept of just by the name of it um one of the the things to note here is like you said we're constructing a, a cylinder out of something that uh you know technically is possibly not perfectly a cylinder on the part but when you have 10,000 points yeah. to make that and you're fitting a cylinder to those as perfectly as possible that's a lot of data yeah. and it represents that feature really well yeah. the the thing about that is when you take normal cmm measurements you might measure a cylinder with 18 points or something you know you you, you have a lot less data to construct that with and this is using over 10,000 points to make that so it's just a very uh, a very robust construction of that feature um, and I'm I know that that is something it's hard to conceptualize yep. 
when we're talking about, you know, well, this is a cylinder and this is a cone and this is a sphere. And we talk through these geometric shapes that we're constructing um, and we talk about how many points. And the reason it's important is because the more points we get, the better that construction actually approximates what that feature is. Right. Um, and that kind of carries through to where we get to the body of the vase, which um, to me is one of the most interesting parts. Uh, it's it's got a lot going on there that I think is important to point out and talk to in a little bit of detail. Yep. Yep. And then the other thing to point out, I think, on this one is that is that you're defining like sort of control surface B here. So that's the if you like the vertical axis uh yeah. relative to the x-axis or the horizontal plane of the top of it so you've got now yeah. now true now two control surfaces that you can measure the other aspects of the vase against yeah. yeah and this is uh kind of shown here so if we go down to the vase body you can see where this coordinate system ends up yep and the the key thing about that is so as alex had kind of alluded to before that top plane is going to control three rotations yep and well actually it's two rotations like that yep and like that and then a translation right, right. that third rotation is not controlled here but that's okay because these features are not something that need to be clocked right that's what that last rotation is and then positionally that plane can shift around and once you define that B as the cylinder, that locks it to the center point of that cylinder. Okay. So now we have a coordinate system on the top, leveled to the top, and exactly in the center of where that cylinder is. Ah, okay. So that defines the center axis of the whole entire base that we are going to talk about all those other features in relation to. Okay. Got it. Uh, so if you if you want, I'll go through and Please. talk about the body. Yeah. Okay. Um, so this is this is really interesting, and I have some I have some props here that I uh, I kind of wanted to go over because yeah, it's yeah. something that um, I guess is a hard concept. I'll talk about the the report real quick okay. um, before I stop uh, sharing. So for this vase body feature, this spherical feature that we're constructing. We're going to use over 77,000 points to do that. Um, and the control that we're using uh, is coaxiality. So it, it sounds just like what it is. You have features that are along the same axis and you're measuring how close that is. Um, so again, that's relative to B, which is the cylinder on that mouth. And that measurement comes out at 17 thousandths, um, which is relative to a lot of the other numbers on this report it's a little bit bigger but i'm going to explain why it's still uh insane so <laughs> yeah it's still remarkable precision yes yeah. it is it is very remarkable um so what i have here is uh what we call a uh, calibration sphere mm -hmm. or a qualification sphere so this guy is an artifact it is serialized and it has a very precise measurement that is uh, essentially traceable, right? So we know that this sphere is spherical. <laughs> These are pretty much as spherical as we can make things, all right? The importance of that is no matter how I measure this, if I measure with five points across the whole sphere, or I measure five points in a little tiny area, that math will result in the same center point being calculated because it is very spherical. Right. That's a very important concept here because I'm going to apply that to the sphere that we have in the middle of this vase that uses almost 78,000 points to construct a sphere and is in line with the center of that mouth with a deviation of 17 thousandths of an inch. Yeah. And that's in two axes. That's in two axes. In that two is axes a composite well. <laughs> deviation. So if you were to look at that in X and Y, you can imagine that that's actually not 
as large of a number in a single axis. Yeah. Yeah. This may be a little difficult to see, but this is the gap between the teeth of the this pair of calipers. That is a <laughs> seventeen thousandths deviation. Yeah. So yeah. And again, if you think about yeah. it in terms of sheets of paper, you're you're just roughly over two, two sheets, sheets of, of paper. paper. That's two sheets of printer paper off of the center line of a feature that's uh, considerably far away for what we're talking about here. And again, the reason I brought up this sphere is because when you measure a sphere, the form of that sphere impacts where you find the center point. The center point is what we are saying is 17 thousandths off. So if that sphere was not symmetric, it wasn't a good formed sphere so you can imagine you could have a sphere that kind of looks like this right yep or you could have a perfect sphere when you deform that sphere it changes the center point right where it's measured so you have to actually make that feature very symmetrically spherical to be able to get that center point to line up like it is wow. which is important because you don't do that by hand over such a large area in granite, in granite, in rose granite. It's it's just um, something that I can't see physically being possible. You have to have this thing on a rotational axis that is very stable yeah. and be turning it about that axis to create a sphere like that. Um, so it's it's really just crazy to see this. It was it was one of the things that I didn't expect and when we saw this we were just like yeah this this is it right here yeah um yeah well and, and that's not even <laughs> getting to the lug handles so yeah i mean yeah and that's right and the lug handles are even more impressive but that's thank you for explaining that 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 yeah that's just well yeah of course it was you know flint chisels and pounding stones right that's <laughs> yeah of how it was done <laughs> yeah jesus yeah wow that that yeah, that that's I, that's a great way. That's that relative geometry, and then that that explanation of yeah. I mean, how do you even keep the? Because even if it's turning right, even if you've got that thing precisely centered, and you're carving that part of the vase, you still have to maintain that spherical geometry on that section mm -hmm. precisely. Like to, otherwise, yeah, you'll skew off those readings that you make thousands of years later. So it's, I can yeah, I can understand that. So to me, it's it's not just okay. Was it turned? Yes. Was it cut in granite very precise? Yes, but then whatever's guiding that tool also just has to be operating with some remarkable degree of just just precision and, and steadiness. I mean, that's, yeah, it's, it's nuts. Yeah, and it's safe to assume when, you know, in order to control that central axis, as Nick said, to carve the outside of the body, the restraint then would have had to have been on the already fabricated inside lip of the vase. Right, and then also to be able to restrain it with enough pressure to keep it from deforming, and maintain that geometry is remarkable. Mm -hmm. yeah. the, the question of whether it's turned, I mean, some of these look like they were, but it doesn't explain the lug handles. You would have had to remove that That's and right. make sure that the contours are the exact yeah. same measurements as everything else, which without turning it. So if you can do that, why would you turn it to begin with? It would, yeah, if we were to do this today in the shop, it would be an initial turn with the geometry for the lug handles as one, which yeah. would then come back with a mill mm -hmm. to finish between the lug handles. Yeah. That, um, that was a question I had, which would be if we were yeah. to try and make this today, how would we do it? And I assume it would be, yeah, a combination a of lathe and then like five axis CNC yeah. yep. high end machine. Yeah. Yeah, and those are very high end and expense, expensive. Yeah, I'll bet. <laughs> yeah. yeah um, the, yeah. the question of provenance, I you know, I've addressed a few times, and uh, I would argue with anyone who would say that uh, that would argue the provenance of these of these vases. This one um, obviously did not come out of a museum, but if they were to argue the provenance, I would ask them to show me how they could make it so cheaply. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and bear in mind too that this this the technology that we have today with these five axis mills not like we've had that since the industrial age, where a lot of these things came. You know, these kings. I know a lot of them went into private collection through that period. I mean, it's it's a whole meta point about the nature of even seeing things like the the tube drills, Petrie's Core Seven, looking at saw marks and the evidence for circular saws. Like we, it took our civilization up until the industrial age to to, to really even be able to put that stuff into context. Like mm -hmm. even to, to for guys like Petrie to be one of some of the first to look at it and say, 
what is this? Like we do, you know, we're starting to develop these capabilities for machining ourselves and I'm looking at the same evidence, but it's, you know, it's in stone that's been sitting here for thousands of years on sites like Abu Sir and wherever else. Like that, yeah, it's, a, I, I would, that's, it's just, it blows my mind to think about that. And it took us that long to even start to have the framework to, to understand what we're looking at. And, and as you said, you know, civilizations will tend to try to solve problems through the lens of their, you know, their own experience. Yep. So Nick and I can sit here and discuss how we would make this vase today, but we do need to be grounded and, you know, recognize we don't have evidence for it. The, yep. you know, this is the very basics of reverse engineering is we're starting with a finished piece and trying to work our way backwards. Mm -hmm. And we can only address the evidence in front of us yep. for the time being. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, let's uh, yeah, let's get into the the log handles then, because those things are, yeah, cause, and and the point we made a minute ago, or, or Nick made, and and uh, Adam also you made is is that yeah, it's you can't turn the log handles right. That's the, and I get this, I do get this comment quite a bit when we're talking about vases, and and I've been talking about the evidence for lathes. Petrie talked about lathes, but yes, you cannot turn. We obviously you can't turn those lug handles you'd have to leave a, a ridge or a bull nose or something that's in that in that geometry of the lug handles all the way around then come back with the if you were turning it and you'd have to come back with a different tool uh which i think as you guys told me last time just changing tools with this type of precision um can introduce errors and often does mm -hmm. yeah so one of the big things with the uh, lug handles that is very interesting is that uh, to each other um, we have obviously so I wanted to point out lug handle one is designated as datum F yep. um, and that is what we use on lug handle two in that parallelism uh, call out so to each other parallel they're seven thousandths of an inch uh, parallel and then we look at both of them back to that uh, top flat and then the center cylinder. And we're looking at the parallelism of those cylinders, the lug handles to that top flat. And the lug handle one is a thousandth of an inch parallel. And the lug handle two is five thousandths of an inch parallel. And then the perpendicularities line up uh really well with that kind of range of measurement where you have both of those being reported as three thousandths of an inch perpendicular to that uh center cylinder so it, again we're looking at a, a piece that has five thousand years worth of wear and damage and mm -hmm. these numbers are something yeah. that <laughs> you wouldn't find in something that you uh, hand cut. No. Reference yeah. to each other, at the very least, they are so close in being parallel. And then when you start looking at things, and we have talked a little bit about this before, Ben, where, you know, it's the crazy part about measurement isn't something how circular it is or how, you know, how flat it is or it's that geometry in reference to something else somewhere else right when you start being able to have that ability that means that you're not just cutting something by hand and making it look nice then going to the other side and cutting it by hand and making it look nice you have some way of making those so similar that it just ends up being parallel whether that is some form of technology or or some pattern or I have no idea, as Alex said, you know, the, the thing about this is we're we're looking at a data set and we're not sure what made these vases and what technology they had, but it's very obvious that the technology was such that uh, it was not at least hand cut. Oh yeah. Uh, that is for sure. For sure. Yeah, and and I think the it may not have been cut at all. Yeah, yeah, that, that's right. There could be an, any number of other. Who knows? Like that's the thing. We we just don't we don't know what's we don't know what we don't know in this yep. sort of thing. And I and I tried to raise the same thing on on Rogan and say you know we'll know more in 
a, a dec- you know, a year, ten years, a hundred years when it comes to science. So some of these answers may exist outside of our current realm of yeah. knowledge. But at least just looking at this, and when when I think about things like symmetry, we've got these vases, and I know Alex, you talked about the the point you did a little experiment with a tolerance gauge. You measured it, you stuck it against like one of the lug handles, and spun the vase, and it yeah. just it didn't even and, budge when it touched the yeah. other one. So it's there's the indicator zeroed <laughs> indicated, on both. Uh, and that was at reference to the bottom of the vase, so it would have been a, a different reference surface um, in order to tell the difference between the two. Yeah. But still remarkable precision. ...height on this side as you do the other. So everything seems to be in alignment. You've got, uh, you've got concentricity between this area, that area, and, the, inside. and, the, and the whole thing. Right, but if, if it's a, I mean, a CNC machine would do that. I don't think you needed to be spinning this thing. Well, I mean, a, a simple lathe, you know, uh, would do it. Not that you wouldn't have to be CNC. You, yeah, you can't really argue for a CNC, but certainly uh, a machine. And, uh, you know, Petrie talked about uh, Egyptian lathes, ancient lathes. Well, you can see spirals in the middle, in the inside, so that yeah. was clearly yeah. drilled out or something, right? I mean, that, that's remarkable. I wasn't expecting to see that. That precision, yeah. No. Yeah, and, and for my mind, one of the things, that, and I mentioned this as well, which was when you look at this, you think about symmetry and you look at some of the faces and, you know, your dad's work with the, the photographs and the reverse transparencies of the Ramsey's head. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's it's almost like this is the efficient way to design it, right? You create a template, you create a design for one handle, you flip it and you just mirror it over here and then you execute it. And, mm-hmm. I mean, it's not that's it's just from an efficiency perspective maybe that's how it might have been done but that you know the symmetry is something we see and i think it's a real indicator of some form of 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 advanced technology being utilized to my mind anyway yeah absolutely okay very cool so we'll move on uh from the lug handles and we i picked a couple more reference surfaces so the top so the, the, the overall shape of the vase can be described as an ellipsoid. So it does not follow one singular um, style of feature as we had as we had spoke. So the top of it close most closely resembled a cone. So it was reduced down to a cone over about 30,000 points, which is still a remarkable amount of data. And uh, these two results are, are also astounding. So you have parallelism to what we had determined as datum B, which is the inside lip of the of the vase. Uh, I'm sorry, perpendicular. Or, yeah, parallelism to B, um, perpendicularity to A, um, as our uh, top reference surface. So the cone is considered a line reducible feature. So if you look at just two lines, yep, um, what their what their relationship is to one another at the plane and the line. My apologies. You're still you know three and sub three thousandths of an inch so you know your typical width of a human hair (laughs) in geometric accuracy so once again very high evidence of a very precise tool uh, that created these features Uh, the bottom lip of the of the vase as well um, has some curvature to it so that was reduced down to a sphere which is a point reducible feature similar to what we did with the body and over you know, 4,300 points, we have 10 thousandths of an inch in deviation. Remarkable numbers. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And yeah. Well, and the, the bottom. Same, and assume the same inference that Nick you made earlier about this spherical geometry of keeping that thing centered. Yeah. yeah. Same. Mm-hmm. Same. Yeah. Same points making that. Okay. So yeah, a lot. A lot of the function of GD and T is that it will also absorb the form of the features being inspected. Okay. So. Um, while it's not reportable for a sphere, it's still taken into account when you look at the deviation of that point from our uh, datum structure coordinate system. Okay. And the bottom of the vase was also reduced to a cone with a parallelism of B of nine thou and perpendicularity to A of five. Yeah. Once again, still sub 10 and over a much larger volume set about 58,000 points <laughs> right and it's so, and a long way from surfaces a and b which are at the other end of the vase right exactly. so yeah. yeah the further you get away from your reference mm-hmm. surfaces the greater deviations you tend to see in your hardware yeah it's remarkable i i, I don't know what else to say about it so that's <laughs> that's cool it's it's 
I think that's the challenge, right? I think that's you know I'm I'm hopeful that that this I know uh, I'm hopeful that these res- these results and and I think this discussion can I'm hoping it can move the whole dis- I mean the whole topic of of ancient engineering and ancient technology and precision along a little bit because you know I I don't know I'd put a challenge out to anybody that suggests you can make this type of thing by hand to to give it a go and see if you can yeah. get it scanned and, and see how close you get document how you do it with the the primitive techniques and see what what realm of uh of One precision thing. you can get into i'm i i i'm i'm fairly skeptical that it's that it's possible <laughs> let's just say that even if even if it was you know we talked about this many times too like the law of large numbers suggests that even if it was possible it would have taken a long time mm-hmm. i don't think anybody would dispute that it could take months years whatever the value would be very high you know these wouldn't be cheap pieces for anybody in any in any time period in any epoch in any culture you know in any part of the world so how do you take and i think lauer was the one that was excavating sakara and he found multiple caches of yep. like 20 30 40 000 stacked up like tupperware yep. if they're that valuable you wouldn't just throw them in the closet and shut the door right yeah i mean they do, i think you have to i think people saw the value in them and maybe joe's had just had the I, I do think there's a you can see this in later epochs in egypt in particular the the new kingdom 19th dynasty where these kings seeing themselves as gods would would i think in a lot of cases reclaim older artifacts and and they certainly got in the practice of writing their names on damn near everything i mean mm-hmm. you've got statues and 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 other yeah. like artifacts with three or four different pharaohs names written on it until you know ramses and meron patar figured out that well if they carve their name really deeply then they can, they make it real difficult for other people to right. to erase never, it never high relief right but like the yeah. the ancients the ancients you know their first inclination was to do high relief and everybody else was low that's right so yeah so uh, b- back to the challenge that you know w- would ideally be presented to anyone that wants to to face it would be um one thing that Nick and I are working on is generating a step file from the STL file that we have of a scan so it's an uncommonly known fact that a scan file can't just be automatically translated into CAD. It has to be sketched off of the existing scan to make a solid CAD body. Okay. So we're in the process of creating CAD and a drawing for this vase and would like to release it um, through whichever medium we would all seem uh, most appropriate to say, I'd like to offer this up to be made in a machine shop out of aluminum. If somebody wants to try to make it by hand out of clay, and if someone thinks they can make it by hand out of granite, that's fantastic because yeah. we need to explore any and all ideas mm-hmm. of manufacture for this. But the most important part of this work is that we are we are able to hold it to the same stringent measurement standards and really truly vet whether or not this is capable, you know, to be done in the way that is commonly accepted. So if at, if our best artisans not you know i can't make assumptions of who would actually take up this challenge mm-hmm. to create this piece by hand we can say here with an assumptive tone that it can't be done by hand just based on our manufacturing experience but the challenge has to be put forth to yeah. um yeah. to anyone who thinks that they can and also the challenge to see who can do it on a machine because mm-hmm. that is also an extremely difficult task on its own to hold these tolerances yeah yeah, yeah and i think the the big point here is that you know, in presenting this data, um, we don't want to make an assumption and say, you know, you can't, but right now we haven't seen it. Hmm. And yeah. we would love to see it. Yes. Yeah. Because yeah. that would give us a lot more insight on how it was done and possibly how valuable this is or, or mm-hmm. why they would have done that. If it really is a simple process of just pounding a stone against on a stone. chisel, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, and, and carving this thing out, then that's, you know, that's fine. Yeah. The idea here is to to find out what was done. I, I don't yeah. want to. Well, yeah. yeah, I would, I would, and this is, I would channel, and I've repeated this many times in my videos, uh, Alex, one of your, uh, your favorite quotes from your dad's books, uh, Chris Dunn's books is, you know, he has a four-step test in there for experimentalists. And I think that's, exactly along the lines of what we need to follow which is you have to honestly evaluate the ancient mm-hmm. artifact including the most difficult aspects of it and then you know go and do do what you you know make it replicate it using the methods you think made it and then do a honest comparison of it including those most difficult aspects it's the same thing i come back with every time somebody you know laps a, a surface down to get pretty flat or somebody carves like an inside corner on a block of granite just in isolation i'm like these are these are elements of these artifacts, sure, but 
there's many more difficult aspects of them and I think the main thing and I see this and I think we we might find the same thing if we could analyze things like boxes and and some of the yeah. other artifacts it's it's the relativity of these planes to each other because you know these aren't these are single piece objects like they're not they're not as far as we know not cast you know they're not bolted together from different pieces they're they're carved in a a single piece of granite I mean or very hard stone and you know, maintaining that geometry across a single object is a massive part of that precision. And that's what we're seeing with the results of scans like these. Absolutely. And the, um, the process of performing the scans, whether it is with the intention of proving geometric accuracy um, from a preservation standpoint is, is uh, invaluable on its own to have you know, very, very precise scan data of some priceless artifacts to, uh, to human existence is um a task worth performing regardless of the intention of outcome yeah yeah and we might learn something right that's the other thing like we we, we, yeah. we can only stand to learn something from from this exercise mm. so precisely yeah yeah i think that's one of the things that really uh drove me to get really interested in this is you know i i enjoy measurement for the truth that it brings yeah and the data is data it doesn't have an opinion it's just a fact yeah and I am completely open-minded to what the data means, but at the end of the day, we have to go out and we need to collect more and see if there are correlations to be, to be made. You know, if there's statistical uh, analysis that we can do over a, a, a set of, you know, a thousand vases and see, is this, like Alex said earlier, a standard part? Because in manufacturing today, that's what we do. We mm -hmm. run statistical analysis to ensure that our process is creating a part that is conforming and that is uh, more or less standard yep. mm -hmm. the whole way through. Yeah. Um, and if this is the same thing, we would see it. I mean, we would see it with the techniques that we analyze things with today. Um, that would be really interesting to see because it would give us a little more insight. Yeah, and that's, that's, a, that's a great point that Nick brought up. Like the world's full of anomalous objects, but if we can demonstrate that this is like a repeatable technique, potentially used by the same tech or the same tools all over the place, not just in the vases, but in the other components that are basically littering the desert in Egypt, yeah. um, you know, we would have some pretty significant statistical evidence. I agree. Yeah, and it's a good time to reiterate that uh, that 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 I guess asks to anybody that has access to these types of artifacts that that thinks they display these elements of precision, then please do reach out because I know you guys are well connected around the world and you, you know, people that have access to these, to these types of machines in lots of places and it would be fantastic to build up a body of work so we can start doing exactly that. Mm -hmm. We can yeah. start with Petri core number seven. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. On my list. Yes. yes. Definitely. Yeah. Yep. Yep. That's, that's the beauty of this work as well is that once digitized, the evidence is irrefutable and Indeed. that will uh, <laughs> save a lot of time. <laughs> it sure will yeah. yeah very good all right guys thanks that's that's epic uh cool thank you so much for uh for reach for uh for spending some time with me chatting is there any you you guys on social media or anything like that do you want people bothering you on those fields or anything or just they can all do it through me yeah uh, up no, to you guys. no, no social here. media here yeah, everybody okay. can just all right, through, yeah. throw it at you all right <laughs> yeah. good good yeah, well, well we'll stay in touch but yeah thanks so much for chatting with me i appreciate yeah, it yeah yeah thank you cool thanks ben cheers all right. Take care. All right. Well, there you have it. Some utterly astounding results and something that I think is a world first, scanning a truly ancient artifact down to this level of precision and some legitimate expert analysis of the results. I want to extend my sincere thanks to Alex Dunn, Nick Sierra and Adam Young for their time and their efforts in getting this work done, as well as for reaching out to me to help communicate the results. Personally, and based on my own research in this field, I think the implications of this work on our understanding of ancient technology, technology that must have been utilized who knows how many thousands of years ago, are profound. And I do think that this work represents a game-changing advance to the whole discussion of just what might have been happening in the distant eras of our own past. There are a host of other implications and details we could get into based on these results, and we do get into them in the full discussion with Alex, Nick, and Adam. I will release the full talk with those guys in podcast format as the next video on this channel, so hit the like and subscribe button if you're interested in that.
Before I finish here, I want to acknowledge that many other people around the world have also been making legitimate efforts to explore the depths of ancient precision in scales both large and small, and I'm hugely encouraged by those efforts, even if they mostly seem to come from independent or so-called alternative fields. My friend Patrice Poyard and his team have done excellent work scanning and analysing the granite caves of Barabar in India, along with detailed investigations into stonework in other places, as documented in his highly recommended work, Builders of the Ancient Mysteries. This documentary is now free to watch on YouTube. Please do check it out. It's definitely worth your time. And if you want to support their efforts, check out the affiliate link to watch it for a few bucks. You can find it linked below in the description. If you're watching this and you do happen to have access to artifacts like this vase and you're willing to have them analysed, then please contact me. As discussed in the video, we hope to build up a body of work and you'd be contributing to the cause of open-minded research into our past, a growing movement that I feel confident will only get stronger. Also, to those who might snort in derision at this video, You can almost hear the snorts of derision. And to those who think that they have all the answers and that the idea of ancient tech is nonsense, well, here's your challenge. Get your sticks and your stones and go to town on a chunk of diorite. Document your process honestly, and then, well, let's scan it and compare results, because the bar has most definitely been set, and the data doesn't lie. For everyone else, many thanks for watching this video. I greatly appreciate your time, particularly if you made it this far. A huge thank you to everybody who supports my channel, in particular to the producers mentioned in the credits. Those are forever credits, they're real, and they work the same way Hollywood ones do, and I'll always vouch for them. A shout out and thank you to patrons and channel members also, you guys are the reason that I can keep making this content. I work on the value for value model, I don't do sponsorships, so if you get some value from my work and you'd like to return some of that value back to me, there's lots of ways to do that. They're all outlined on my website at unchartedx.com support. Cheers everyone, and I'll see you all in the next one.